I'm Ben Summers, and welcome to the Shadow Banker Secrets Podcast, based on the book I wrote by the same name. To help guide today's discussion, I've got my good friend and colleague, Stefan Pascano. I thank you for having me on with you today. It's honestly an honor to be on with you for the first podcast for Shadow Banker Secrets. And having known what you teach and uh, seen the infrastructure you've developed, I feel like there's a need to get the content that you've provided to people in a high level for several years out to the general public because we've got a lot of chaos going on in the markets right now. And uh, I feel like what you do is needed more now than it ever has been. The big motivation for doing this is that the ideas and the concepts and, and the driving forces behind the chaos we see are complex. And it's one thing to write about that in a book, but it's something else to have a familiar conversation. Like you and I have talked about for a long time. Um, it's different when you're engaged, uh, when you're having a dialogue, when you're working together versus reading black and white on a page. So the hope is to, from my perspective, to walk people through a similar path that you went through to gain some of the sort of firsthand insights um, that drive what's going on today? Exactly. Well, no, and that's the thing. I mean, and I can speak to it from an organic perspective, Ben, because, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, when, and, and I've known Ben for about, I guess, seven, eight years now, um, but really the last couple of years, and we've done some projects together, and uh, I started to really dissect what you do and uh, some of the infrastructure that you've built, it took me personally, even though, I mean, I'm a savvy real estate investor, I bought a couple hundred units and uh, had a lot of success. You know, I always joke with you, I only understand about 40% of what you say. <laughs> so, you know, uh, when I've talked with people that have read your book, read the content, everybody's blown away by the intelligence aspect of it, but a lot of people still don't understand it at a layman's terms level. And because of our friendship, you know, I'm thankful that you've been able to talk with me and I can kind of dissect uh, what you've done and ask you again and again the same questions until I do understand it to where when the light bulb goes off, um, it changes everything. We want to explore that a little bit. I want to hear about your backstory, talk about what your natural evolution was to get to where you're at, to where you could provide this to other people and, uh, you know, give people that level of access. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and, and for me personally, it, it's a double-edged sword in a, to, a, in a, to an extent. Right now, like it's, there's hardship created by the, the macro turbulence at every turn. But on the flip side, it's beginning to bring people's attention to really important ideas that I think may have been neglected for a very long time. Um, so, for example, maybe not a lot of people, but at least a decent number, have been aware of the fact that the Fed prints money, right? That fractional reserve banking allows commercial banks to print money. And most people, even the few who are aware of this stuff, are kind of like, well, what can you do about it? It's just kind of like, um, it's just how things are and I'm just a victim. Well, my mission, what I've done, is to take those same processes and that same expertise to anybody with the will and the motivation to hear and to, and to move on it to actually create capital and monetize it in perfectly analogous ways. So now it's not like, oh, creating capital is just something the banking system can do. Well, it's now something that you can do too. It always has been actually. And again, it's, it's my intent to, to bring that wherewithal um, to as many people as I can. Well, and, and that's the mission statement that we really connected on, right? Because, I mean, it, it, it's about taking – all these things have been done since the inception of our country, since the inception of the financial system, right? But normally it's the big banks, it's the Wall Street guys that are doing this, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley. What I love about what you've done, and it connects perfectly with everything that I've preached in my network for a decade plus now, is that you put that same type of knowledge – and resources in the hands of the individual. And and the funny thing is, it's like I was just talking with one of um, your client, our mutual associates, um, that's invested within some of the strategies that you've done the other day. And, you know, I, I said, anybody can do this, and but it's that barrier, that knowledge barrier to where at first it seems like it's so complex, you just don't even try. And that's what the media pushes. That's what um, the big banks want the media to push is that, 
you know what, it's too complicated, you can't figure it out, so don't even try, just leave it to us, we'll give you your, you know, two and a half percent CD rates for a five-year lockup, and, and we'll take the 40% upside on the back end, so don't even mess with it. What you've done is you've given people access to that opportunity, and once that light bulb goes off, like me and, the, and your other client were, were discussing, it goes off, and then it's so simple to some extent. Yeah, um, I think that's true for a lot of things, right? Everything new feels complicated. And, and I don't want to misrepresent the fact that finance is a complicated discipline. I mean, I'm not talking about the sales function, but hardcore finance, quantitative um, analysis, uh, financial engineering, it's, it's complicated. But arguably, not that much more complicated than wholesaling real estate. Like, if you, yeah. if you think about the first time you tried to negotiate an owner-financed property, right? It probably, the, the seller probably thought you were speaking Greek, right? And I think yeah. uh, one of the hurdles, well, I, I think- I thought I had a 400 credit score and nobody, anyway. <laughs> Touche. But when you, when, you, when you talk about creative structures in real estate, especially a decade or so ago, that was extremely complex and esoteric and like, you're, you're on the fringe if you even bring it up. And I mean, people were studying, how do you even broach the subject with a potential seller? Um, and now it's relatively mainstream. And my intent is to bring um, financial engineering practices that are sort of held in secret to the public and so that they become equally as familiar. And uh, that sort of, as you pointed out, sort of air of complexity is kind of removed and people feel that it's more accessible. Like Bitcoin's a perfect example of what you're talking about, too, maybe even more so than like on the real estate side, because I remember my web developer that worked for me in 2012 told me about Bitcoin. And at the time and people, it, honestly, when I say this, I feel like people are going to not even remember how crazy it was to think about buying Bitcoin in 2012. I mean, it, it was it almost felt like you were doing a drug deal to try to buy, and, <laughs> to buy a cryptocurrency. And so um, anyhow, but he told me about it back then, had I bought that, I'd have like a net worth of $70 million right now, like anybody would. But um, at the time it sounded crazy, I didn't understand it, I passed on it, I bought gold and silver instead, more real estate, so on so forth, whatever it is, I regret that obviously. With what you're doing, for a lot of people on this call or to get to see this content, it might have that same kind of feel to where they don't even understand what we're talking about, so they just tune it out. But what you're doing, we've already seen it in the 18 months that we've really been working together. We've seen people starting to adopt at an institutional level some of the things that you teach, and it become more and more common. So anybody that gets access to this and what you're preaching now kind of has that Bitcoin advantage, I guess I could call it, uh, over the rest of the market to where you're going to have a, an opportunity to see something that five, ten years from now is going to be commonplace, or right now it's not. Do you agree with that? I, or do I, I, that? I agree. And uh, like I think you mentioned you want to talk about today, like my evolution is yeah. evidence and proof of that, right? Yeah, I grew up in the swamps of Louisiana, right? Like finance beyond like your retail financial advisory is something that's just unheard of. It's not even thought about, right? My academic background is in physics. It's not in finance. I never took a business class. I never took an econ class. I never took a finance class. Um, I played baseball for a long time. I worked in the energy services industry for a bit before moving into real estate and then quickly evolved into finance. So I, I, obviously then I don't have the resume from one of the big wirehouses, even a small retail advisory firm. That's not even on my re resume. I came into this industry as a complete and teetotal outsider, and now, arguably, operate at the top of that industry. And yeah. so, um, I think maybe sharing some of my story, if nothing else, provides um, a pathway, if not hope, for or an example to show that anybody from any background with the will can achieve anything in this regard. Yeah, well, and, and I appreciate you saying that. I mean, and honestly, that's, again, what made me connect with you as well is that, you know, it, you've done all of this based on, obviously you have a knowledge base, obviously you're intelligent, but you also base everything kind of on fundamentals and common sense. 
And I think sometimes that's lost today in the world of finance to where people get so set in a box of doing things one way that they totally black out common sense. And you've introduced that to the market. And like you said, you've not only got some of the big boys in the sector that have been with Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley for a decade plus working for you, you, um, you know, they all respect you and respect what you built. So let's talk about that. Let's kind of dive in a little bit on your backstory. Uh, talk to me about where it all started. I mean, you've had a pretty interesting career and an interesting life, really, because like you said, I mean, you kind of downplayed it there a little bit, but you were a professional baseball player. Um, I mean, you've had an evolution through real estate, through raising funds and developing what you develop. Talk to me about where that all started and, and what gave you, talk to me about the evolution of having the desire to even go down this path because it's a unique trail. Yeah, so I, I never knew I wanted to go down this path until, hell, probably my 30s. Um, so I grew up in Louisiana and if you're not from Louisiana, it may be hard to appreciate this, but the entire self-esteem of the state is vested in the LSU athletic department, right? So the, the means, <laughs> fair, fair enough. <laughs> so the means for socioeconomic development in the state, right? Like, or, or socioeconomic uh, status growth is like be an athlete at LSU, right? That's what you do, right? And then I can't tell you how many former L LSU athletes left the state, gone and played professionally, come back, and they've got great careers, largely due to the fact that they've got name recognition from being an athlete at LSU. Um, so it's arguably, obviously, a fairly provincial perspective, um, but that's all I knew, and that's what I grew up in. So, like, I wanted to be an athlete, and that's what I was. So um, I played ba football and baseball for a very long time, had the opportunity to play uh, both football and baseball at the Division I level, uh, wound up playing baseball professionally for a few years, and... Um, when my career began winding down, um, my father influenced me to go into the oil and gas industry. And I did, all right, um, so why not? Um, I had an academic background in physics. I wound up graduating um, just before spring training uh, after my second year of pro ball. So I'd gotten my degree finished up. And um, having that technical background uh, was conducive to working as a, starting out as a field engineer in energy services. Um, what was disappointing is that I was brought up in kind of a, with an idealistic view of the world, right? Like merit wins the day. And the oil and gas industry is very fraternal. Um, yeah. my, my father's generation, to their credit, effectively developed the industry as we know it today, but they don't want to let it go. And so they, it, it's very difficult to um, earn your worth, so to speak, because again, there's, it's, it's kind of an anti-intellectual uh, industry. Um, the good old boys, so to speak, are gonna keep theirs and good luck trying to get yours. So it, it didn't take long uh, to realize that I needed to go do my own thing. Um, and as a matter of fact, when I first left baseball, I was arguably depressed for a year. The only takeaway is that I developed a taste for scotch. Um, but beyond that, <laughs> the, beyond that, like I had, really lost my identity. I was a baseball guy. And then now I'm, you know, literally riding a school bus to the middle of a refinery to do construction, right, management yeah, work. Yeah, Tom Brady right? effect. That's why he came back in 40 days. There. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I, I, I can empathize to some extent, at least. Um, so it took about a year to, to really develop a new identity and a new passion that rivaled that, that pursuit of sports. And that was just independence, right? I've got no interest whatsoever in controlling anybody else. But for God's sake, I don't want anybody controlling me. All right? I want no one to have any leverage over me in any regard whatsoever. And that became the new passion. And so um, I was working in West Africa, uh, extremely frustrated with absolutely everything. And um, considered, right, what can I do? And startup capital is the biggest challenge for most businesses. And this is 2004, 2005. Um, Real estate provides the greatest opportunity for leverage, which in turn means the least amount of required startup capital. And um, there was a decent amount of information available to learn how to you know, get started. Um, and so I spent the last couple of months in West Africa studying 
know, Carlton Sheets and the other real estate investment guys. I was a Carlton Sheets guy too in the '90s. There, yeah, that, he was my guy. Man, if you, I mean, he he gets a, a bad rap uh, sometimes, but it's completely unjustified. If you go through yeah, his course in detail, there are little nuggets of esoteric information there that are still I still use today that just lost yeah. on people, right? Um, but anyway, so yeah, I started out that simplistically. Um, I left West Africa, moved to uh, the Florida Panhandle, and uh, realized very quickly that the one thing that wasn't maybe sufficiently emphasized, and I'm being generous here, is that there are very few really good deals in real estate. And there are a lot of people chasing them, especially 2004, 2005, right? This is, this is right towards the end of the peak of the real estate market. Um, and then the people's idea of a good deal back then was buying anything that you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Rising tide floats all boats. Right. If, if you could get the seller to sell, it was a good deal, yeah. right? Which obviously yeah. wasn't the case. Um, so, um, but I, one thing I was, because I did have a, a bit of a formal corporate background, right? Um, I was a bit rigorous. And. I saw that what was going on was not sustainable. And this is where probably my math background in physics was helpful. So I saw that things were probably overvalued. So I started looking at numbers to say, all right, how should this stuff be valued? If you look back historically, um, what, can we, what, will t what can give us some indications about where we are and where we're going to go? And what I saw was uh, some federally published data on rents and then home valuations, the HPI, the Housing Price Index, and the OER, the Owner Equivalent Rent uh, Metric. Uh, and what they showed was that up until the year 2000, uh, rents and comparable sales-based valuations tracked one-to-one, -one, and they were just in line with inflation, about 2% a year, give or take, with some volatility, but not much. And then in 1999, when the Fed injected itself into the market to bail out the dot-com uh, bubble bursting, uh, valuations, comparable sales-based valuations, took off literally exponentially, while the income just tracked very stably. So I was like, mm, I think it's a safe bet to bet on the income and not the comparable sales-based value. So I compared that to the stock market, uh, the, the analogy of a, a, a P.E. ratio, a price-to-earnings ratio, and um, kind of developed my own valuations there. Caught a lot of flack for that from sort of the uh, realty yeah. It was an alternative view big time at the time, yeah. Yeah, so, um, but the challenge was when I started looking at values from that perspective, I couldn't buy anything, right? Because now I'm looking at stuff that, I'm, I'm trying to buy stuff at a 40, 50% discount to market, and that's yeah. not available, right? Yeah. But at the same time, I discovered this thing called a hard money lender, and oh my God, <laughs> was that revealing, right? I mean, especially yeah, then. Yeah. They kept, they, they, kept, they kept their light under a bushel. Now, now granted, at that point in time, um, internet marketing wasn't as pervasive as it is today, but like you couldn't find those guys. But hell, they required a 30% down payment plus, they were charging 18 plus percent interest, whatever like the usury limits were in a given state, that's what they were charging, right? Yeah, well, so, no, usually they're above the usury limits. <laughs> <laughs> right? I was getting those loans back in 2007. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I mean, it's like these guys, like, why is this so unknown? Like, why is this such a, a hidden thing? Because at that time, I didn't know shit about finance, but I did know, I could intuitively recognize that the money that these people are putting to work is doing way better than the money that anybody else is putting to work, right? They're getting better returns than the people straight up buying real estate, but yet they have like a 35% equity cushion there, right? Yeah. They're, so they're security and stability significantly better than what's being done as an individual real estate investor, for sure, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think like the, one of the key points in, in my development there was the conviction of saying, this is the place to be, right? I didn't look around to other people to say, hey, uh, do you think hard money lending is a good business model? Like, I just, you could, it was obvious, right? Like, that's your, com that's what I t meant at the beginning is that's your common sense, my friend. See, that's what I love about you. You know, you can have all the knowledge base in the world. You can have all the, the fundamentals and analytics, but you need that. You do need all that, but you need that coupled with common sense. And that's what you did during the last crash. And that's what you've done ever since to me. It's interesting. I, I think about this a lot. Um, and we, we can talk about, sort of my evolution on the marketing side at some point. 
but um, you call it common sense. Um, fair statement. Um, but if, if you dive into that a little bit further, it's shocking the number of people who are, would be considered wildly intelligent, right? Like by all objective measures, whether it be IQ test or academic credentials or otherwise, they're off the charts. But there's something else going on in their mind that's a little bit different. And the way I would describe it is they prioritize other people's perspectives. They prioritize other, like the influence of their peers more than they value their own judgment. You know what I think the one word I would put for it when I was just thinking when you were saying that is fear. Sure. And uh, most people act out of fear. And and again, to take it full circle with where we're going in today's conversation, that's the whole for me. That's the whole purpose of this call is to eliminate that fear, because I mean, it's just like when, you know, the pandemic first hit March 2020. I hadn't bought a stock in 10 years. But I went, got a TD Ameritrade account. I bought stock in every airline I could, every hotel I could, casinos, whatever, cruises, because it was clear to me to do the opposite of the hysteria that was going on, just like it was for you in 2005 to 2008, to kind of go against the grain. And that's why I call it common sense. But you're right. It's more than just common sense. It's about having a comfort that you know there's a, a plateau that things follow. And ultimately, it comes back to the mean, and that's what she really built, um, is to simplify that for people. They can kind of piggyback on the work you've done to already figure that out. Am I correct? Yeah, that, that? that's a fair statement. Uh, and, and maybe even extrapolating on that a little bit further, um, I, I can kind of sympathize to some extent, right? So on the one hand, my lack of a traditional path has created unique challenges for me. But this highlights an example of where it was an asset. Can you imagine if you spent your entire life studying from private preschool, right, all the way through private high school, going through an Ivy League education, maybe another Ivy League MBA, you land that uh, position at Goldman, you worked there for years, right? You have been indoctrinated, right? Um, and your entire life's work has been built upon this social dynamic. And it is a social dynamic, right? Like, why would you just fuck that off, right? And say, I'm gonna do my own thing, you know what I mean? Like, It's true. No, and that's what I love about, I mean, that's why people, I mean, we've kind of joked about it. People have called you kind of like uh, the Rodney Dangerfield, you know, and Caddyshack for the sure, yeah. street crowd. You know, and, and it is true, that's what you do. You take a sledgehammer to all of that nonsense, but, but it's true, like, no, there's a no way are you blaming I, in my mind, I call those people the victims because they've been indoctrinated their entire existence. And they're really smart people. It's not that anybody's dumb. It's just they haven't had access to this mindset. And that's what you do with what you teach is you take a sledgehammer to that mindset, to that concept, and uh, and give people, hey, you know what, maybe this works too. And then, uh, you know, those that have capitalized have done really well, right? So anyway. Yeah, so, and, and to be clear, like there are obviously very good and valuable things that come out of that, right? And sure. so um, I'm taking, I'm, I'm utilizing a sledgehammer selectively, right? For, for, for lack of a better term, right? So I'm, I'm quantitative finance, quantitative risk analytics, financial engineering, right? These are relatively esoteric skills that are used by every serious institution. Um, I use them too. I don't take a sledgehammer to those, I glorify those. You're but like a scalpel. It may be a scalpel, right? Um, but what tends to happen is groupthink, right? So like um, you move up into an organization um, and maybe the agenda of that organization is not perfectly aligned with an idealistic pursuit of what should be done. And so maybe the policies of big firms that govern how an industry operates may start to skew how things should be done in favor of what they want to be done, considering their own interests, and then all of the people in their ecosystem just follow along. That's what I take a sledgehammer to. I take a sledgehammer to the bastardization of the merit-based approach that the institutions have gotten away with by virtue of their role in the market. Right? Yep. And because I don't come from that world, 
it was very easy for me to not fear a retaliation because the, the, who's going to... Who's gonna come at me? I'm surrounded by nobody, right? So <laughs> at that time, right? So, um, but yeah, uh, that, that's a good point. And I think one, one example of that, and I talked about identifying the hard money lending crowd as the place to be from a strategy perspective. Well, lending money is a labor intensive exercise, right? So I knew I had to go raise money and the discipline or the industry that's dedicated to raising money, well, that is what finance is by, by, by definition. So um, this is where my naivety kind of got the best of me. So I knew what I knew on the real estate side at this point. I saw what the hard money lending guys were doing, and I saw that traditional finance people knew nothing about this stuff, right? And I was like, oh, this is, a, this is a layup. I'll just tell the finance people about the hard money lending stuff. I'll be the conduit, game over, right? <laughs> like, but then, can I just touch on Sure. Isn't it like insane, looking back on, like 2020 hindsight, you know, whatever, but isn't it insane looking back on it and like things that are so obvious now that like high level professionals didn't know in 2008? Yeah. Um, it's all about cultural inertia, right? Like, when is, it, when is it okay to start talking about things, right? Um, I mean, Tony Robbins, for one thing, he, he writes finance books on occasion, which I find somewhat comical. But in one of his more recent finance books, he actually talks about hard money lending as an option, right? His, his two prescriptions are index, index, and then alternatively, you can be a hard money lender in the real estate space. Um, but yeah, but even that, that being said, still, there is a tremendous... Um, knowledge, cultural, expertise divide between real estate and finance. When you talk about hey, real estate, it's an asset class, and it's arguably becoming, arguably becoming a traditional asset class. Um, I mean, since 2012, when Blackstone started buying up everything off the street, like, I mean, it, it's pretty mainstream now. But even so, they're divided arbitrarily, and I think it's a function of licensing, Right. Um, for example, like securities people need a certain set of licenses. Real estate people need a license, and um, they're just two different sandboxes that just aren't predisposed to communicate. So real estate people don't know anything about finance, and finance people really don't know anything about real estate outside of what's kind of like exchanged amongst the zeitgeist. Right. Wait. This effort of trying to raise money to lend as a hard money lender, which evolved into creating a fund and then trying to raise money to that fund, and eventually evolving into an investment bank. That process has been over a decade plus labor of simply providing communication between real estate and finance, right? And now I've evolved to, I mean, I'm, we're asset class agnostic now. I cut my teeth in real estate. That's where I started. Hard money lending is great. It was great. It always will be great to some extent. Um, but now we work with any asset class and we have kind of, we've moved out of fund management on an individual level or managing our own strategy as an asset manager to financial engineering and capitalizing other asset managers, regardless of their asset class, if their performance is good enough. And so that's where our focus is today. So right now, um, the finance industry is preeminently concerned with pitching and trading equities, right? The whole broker-dealer space gets paid on commission for trades. Um, trillions of dollars of wealth are vested in equities markets and, 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 and fixed income markets, uh, liquid uh, fixed income markets. And so the entire, and the entire financial services industry is vested on selling that stuff. And I'm saying, okay, let's take that agenda, you know, let's move that agenda out of the way for a second, and let's just say, let's try to evaluate what is the best investment, absolutely, in a vacuum, regardless of asset class bias. And that's where we sit today. So it doesn't matter what the underlying asset class or strategy is, all we're looking at is capitalizing the best performance available. And that's measured through the skills that, uh, called quantitative risk analytics, uh, risk adjusted performance measures. But um, we can touch on that a little bit later, I guess. Well, that's what I love about your backstory, Ben. And I mean, I know we both face challenges. I mean, everybody does when they're trying to be an entrepreneur, they're trying to be an investor, trying to have success in whatever their given field is. Um, you know, talk to me a little bit about the roller coaster, if any, that you experienced. I know we talked about the barriers that you experienced with the mainstream Wall Street crowd, but I think that's imperative for us to discuss a little bit here 
for those that are trying to make their own way, for those that maybe you're successful, maybe you're a dentist, maybe you're a psychologist, whatever your field is, maybe you've made a lot of money, but you know that there's more opportunity out there. You know you can better yourself from an investor standpoint uh, and, and really better your financial future for yourself and your family moving forward. Talk to me about the roller coaster that you went on through that process to get to the point we're at now to where it's really a well-oiled machine. There, there were tremendous up and downs, uh, ups and downs. And I'll tell you, like, I never wanted to be a crusader. Um, I mean, I guess some people take, um, don't take the path of least resistance intentionally. Uh, that was not my intent, right? I thought that uh, I was pursuing a path that would be a lay down just by virtue of what it presented from a merit-based perspective. But uh, the reality is it was an extremely tumultuous ride uh, it's been uh, decades of effort. Um, it's been worth it. Um, it's forged me into a better person than I think would have otherwise been. But uh, certainly, certainly a bit of a roller coaster. That's awesome, Bill. Well, you know, I know we're getting a little short on time here for the moment. So I, I really just appreciate you sharing your backstory. I mean, you know, I, I've been telling you for years now, people need to know what created you <laughs> basically what got you to kind of where you're at so i you know i hope we're going to talk more in the future here and kind of go into some of the specifics of the strategies that you've implemented because obviously that's what everybody wants to know i mean the number one thing i mean we can sit here and talk about success you've had i've had individual investors have had investing with you partnering with you but at the end of the day people that are listening to this they want to know the meat and potatoes so i know hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that in the future but i really appreciate you having me today um, on your first podcast and um, and let me be a part of your backstory because to me it's always the backstory that makes the end result and uh, yours is extraordinary my friend so thank you again thank you Seth I've enjoyed it